do something, in 15 years, this club will be gone. The mentality was kind of past the hat. You know, they didn't have budgets, didn't need to. It was supported by a core of affluent families. I, I said to them, I said, well, your strategy is obvious. I said, plan A is every member is going to live forever. But I said, you might want to have plan B. So the issue here, obviously, was membership development. Let me share with you another club. Uh, this I call the case of the who are we really club. Uh, this club, basically, you could split into two interests and two fleets. There was a boozing and cruising club uh, on, on this side. Uh, it was driven by a power fleet, largely recreational. They had a ball. They did some cruising company. They did predicted log kind of stuff. But not a whole lot of structure. It was a bunch of people with power boats having a good time. Uh, the quality of the, the house really mattered. They loved to eat in the club, drink in the club. Uh, not much of a program. Most of the boats, frankly, kind of sat at the club. And then on the right was this kind of active, rowdy, boozing and racing crowd uh, made up of a bunch of one design fleets and uh, overwhelmingly perf, bigger boats. So what's the problem? Why was this not kind of one big happy family? Well, uh, a lot of complications on this Who Are We stuff. This club became a very popular regatta host venue and a distance race destination. The power fleet users hated the commotion, the commotion caused by the sailors. The sailors were basically noisy, messy, wet, poorly dressed people who would come in and trash the place. Uh, one distance race in particular uh, had sort of an epic tradition of leaving nothing standing at the club. Um, frankly, they never really resolved this. And a lot of tension around schedules, just the house schedule, uh, who were all these people occupying the club, uh, an increasingly nasty budget conflict, who's paying for all this stuff, it's costly to host events. Uh, there was, quote, competition who are all these people in the pool? Why are they naked? And where did they come from? And very hot debate about guest privileges. Uh, it over time fractured the membership. About the only thing in common is everybody go to the bar. Frankly, I, I'd like to say this was a happy story of planning is the cure. Never really got resolved. It just kind of self-cured uh, because sadly the sailing component of things diminished. Sailing just kind of diminished over time, and things calmed down. Sadly, it's, in my opinion, nowhere near the club. It used to be. Um, this is one that kind of got ugly. This is a dysfunctional case that was really hellish for the flag officers, for the house committee, and for the house <coughs> staff. Uh, I call this the club within a club. Uh, a group of very influential members and mostly large yacht owners uh, became disgusted with the caliber of house, food, and service. Uh, one of these members was an ex-flag himself. Uh, they basically boycotted the club. So they, they would throw nightly, private, dockside happy hours. There was this kind of battleship row uh, of, of large, you know, large yachts, kind of just off the front of the club. They decided to boycott the house. So they kind of would organize these really cool happy hour and barbecues, dockside. Uh, obviously, it deeply fractured the membership. It became kind of a cult within a club. Uh, board members quit. Club management was fired. Went through, you know, four chefs in two years. Uh, a multi-year revolving door ensued uh, that really made it hard for that club to get it right, just in terms of the basics of kind of execution basic food service, basic drink service, etc. I, I think this case is a parable about flag succession. Didn't go well. Uh, the importance of committees and doing good listening. The House committee here was, you know, in absentia, and in my opinion, kind of derelict in their duty. And, and frankly, the importance of good hiring and retaining good staff. At the heart of this, uh, to some extent, was just bad management, uh, bad house management. And you know, never should have, never should have gotten this badly. Uh, 
but, but to me, the dark side of yacht clubs is that, you know, the bright side is we all joke about the bar. The dark side is everybody bitches about the food. Anybody ever heard complaints about food at a yacht club? <laughs> Show of hands. Anybody ever heard complaints? It's unbelievable how this stuff kind of takes on a life of its own. Here's, uh, I call this one the case of the border war. This is all about facilities planning, budgeting, leadership's ability to carefully balance member interests. I, I almost fell out of my chair this morning when Gary was joking about the pool. Uh, this is a club that had a very successful on the water program, very good youth program. Uh, a, a group within the club decided to appropriate a chunk of the dry sail area and a chunk of the boat yard for tennis courts, a tennis shack, and a pro shop, and parking. And then paddle tennis courts follow. Now, what they didn't think through was about 5% of the club had any interest in this stuff. And uh, there, was, there was this huge border war over converting, uh, what's, what's the most precious thing in most yacht clubs? Dry sale space. So there was this huge unresolved debate. It just kind of happened. Next thing you know, there's tennis courts. The hardcore sailing membership went berserk. A bunch of sailors and non-sailors started raising concerns about dues, charges, who's going to pay for this, how does it work. The tennis program was initially somewhat popular, never, never really though caught fire and ultimately migrated into poor utilization and marginal usage. Uh, so bye-bye, you know, some prime dry sail space, hello, unused tennis courts. Um, so that leads many of us in the room, and maybe this is why you're here, to end up this way. <laughs> the best part of being Commodore is becoming past Commodore. I get a great table and great service. Uh, I, I drew this from the source of most of my favorite folksy wisdom, which is my aforementioned father. This is something my dad once told me uh, after he put down the phone about 11 o'clock at night because someone had gotten him out of bed to complain about the food at the club. It was interesting being a Commodore's kid. You learn a lot. The one thing you learn is don't ever be Commodore. Um, so let me, let me shift from these kind of tales of woe, now that hopefully I have your attention, to talk about what it could be. There are many, many, many great yacht clubs. Uh, I live in Newport. Uh, I don't know if any of you are from the New England area. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky to be a member of Ida Lewis Yacht Club by marriage. My wife's sitting right here. Ida Lewis is a fabulous yacht club. They don't have membership problems. I'm a member of the New York Yacht Club, fabulous yacht club. It is not a yacht club without challenges. Uh, member of the Royal Ocean Racing Club, fabulous yacht club. There are many, many great clubs. I, I have come to believe that a healthy club, the club we all wish to be part of, uh, has a deep, and I apologize for the acute acronym, has a deep relationship with its members. And, and I want to talk about this deep thing. Uh, I think a deep relationship with the membership, which to me is the crux of the whole thing. To me, this is the crux of the whole thing. The challenge in sailing is membership engagement. It's membership. Clubs in trouble, they're dying and declining. Healthy clubs are thriving. To me, it's all around this core concept of how good's the relationship with the members. So deep, so hopefully you can remember this. I think there are four dimensions of a really constructive relationship between a yacht club and a membership. Number one, development of the membership itself. To a large extent, the membership is the club. Uh, really healthy clubs think a lot about membership development. This is not just admissions. This is a richer concept than admissions. Healthy yacht clubs think a lot about membership development. Second, uh, I believe healthy yacht clubs engage a high percentage of the members. I think the, 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 this is a deeper idea than just active members, although active membership I think says a lot about membership engagement. Healthy yacht clubs engage a very high percentage of the membership. Third, enrichment of member identity and affinity. I'll, I'll talk more about each of these in a moment. This, this one's maybe the weirdest of the four, so we'll spend a little time on it. 
And then finally, perpetuation of the club. I think really strong yacht clubs, really strong community sailing organizations think a lot about not just today, not just, gee, you know, it's Thursday, how do we get to Friday? They think a lot about what do we need to do to lay the foundation to perpetuate the organization, to perpetuate the institution. We are only temporary stewards of this precious resource. How do we ensure a future? Let, let me talk about, let me talk about uh, these attributes. I would assert that each of these four attributes can be discussed, thought about, planned, and managed. And that's where a plan and a process can help. I actually have come to the view that the process matters more than the plan. A good plan is preceded by a listening process, a discussion process, a canvassing process, a syndication process. Dwight Eisenhower, who, who pulled off many, many Planning academics would say the most audacious human endeavor of all time was the planning of the Normandy invasion. Coordinating all those countries, all those troops, all those assets, all those resources, different nationalities, formidable foe. Eisenhower was asked a lot about how did you orchestrate D-Day? And he once famously said, gentlemen, the plan is everything the plan is nothing. And it's kind of a zen-like statement. So what's that mean? He said, look, the plan quickly goes out the window, but it's the discipline of the thought process and the conversations and the adaptive characteristics that go into the planning that position you for success. Uh, just some other quotes while we're at it. I love quotes. Hope is not a strategy. <laughs> Jack Welch of General Electric fame. Ladies and gentlemen, hope is not a strategy. We cannot wish our problems away. Here's another one. I don't believe in dreams and luck. I believe in concrete goals and hard work. That's from Ozzie Guillen, Hall of Fame shortstop, one of the best baseball players ever. And, and then there's that great strategist and philosopher, boxer Mike Tyson, who famously said, Every sucker had a plan till I smacked him in the mouth. <laughs> so take all this planning stuff with a grain of salt. Uh, the plan's the plan until somebody smacks you in the mouth. But I would argue the essential disciplines that should go with a plan, which are really about the process. A plan should be a process of engagement between the flags, the leaders, those six angry guys at the bar. I love that story Gary told this morning. The enemy of the plan, the enemy of this sport, is those six guys at the bar who were the refuseniks, the neotniks. I don't care what the topic is, the answer is no. The plan is do what we've done in the last 40 years. That is not a plan. That is not a plan. That's flying the plane into the mountain. Um, let's talk about each of these in turn. I'd like to start with development. You know, just ask yourself these questions as you think about your organization. Do you have a clear membership development plan and process? Who do we want to be a member? How important is the sailing resume? There are clubs where that's a big deal, clubs where it's not a big deal. There's no right answer on this, by the way. I think the key is to have the discussion and arrive at some kind of shared point of view. What's it mean to be a member? What's the membership profile we want? Do we want a bigger membership, a smaller membership, a more global membership, a local membership, an active membership, uh, a burgee on the bumper membership? You know, what, what kind of membership do we want? That, that is a really gut level, deep, involving conversation. And you'd be amazed, even in harmonious clubs, the, the bandwidth of perspectives on what the membership should be and what the membership should become. Second, engage. This is a tough one. Look yourself in the mirror and ask the question, 
Is our club fun? Is our program any good? Do we offer our members a compelling on the water and shoreside program? Is it a place I want to go? Is it a place I want to take my friends? Is it a place I feel good about? Are we creating unique experiences? Are we creating traditions and memories? You know, I'm up here talking about memories. I'm 58 years old. I remember like yesterday stuff that happened when I was five years old, horsing around with boats with my mom and dad and my brother and sister. And you know, is it, is it that emotive? Is it that evocative? Um, let's talk about enrichment. Uh, are we doing enough? Ask yourself this question. Is my club doing enough membership outreach to create high levels of involvement, participation, identification, and satisfaction? Or is the club dominated by those same six guys sitting in those same chairs, you know, every night and everybody else is kind of slipping away? And then perpetuate. I, th I think the, the perpetuation questions have a lot to do with governance and resources. Are, are, we, are we thoughtfully and intelligently and creatively governing the organization or are we dominating the organization? Do we have sound budgets? Do we have responsible financial stewardship? What's the caliber of our facilities? The worst thing that happens to a club is underfunded deferred maintenance. You know, letting the asset go to pot is, is a terrible, terrible uh, lack of responsibility, I think, on the part of every member and certainly on the part of the leadership. So let's, let's develop each of these just in a little more detail, and, and I'm pretty sure Jack's going to have, uh, you know, takeaways on all this. Consider this just sort of, you know, a checklisty kind of thing. Uh, membership development is a really complicated topic. Um, and, and I think things to consider. First off, does, does, does the decline of our sport from a participation standpoint affect our membership level as a specific club? And I hear all these stats, you know, gee, you know, sailing's down 40%, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I will confess, there are many, many clubs unaffected by that. Ida Lewis has like a hundred year waiting. I'm, I'm only a member because I'm a guest of my wife. So Ida Lewis, sailing could go to zero in the United States and you'd wait a hundred years to get into Ida Lewis. So not every club is affected by broad participation in the sport. But I, I think it's very important to think through as you think about your club, are we directly affected by whether the sport is rising or falling? You know, what's it, what's it say? Uh, about about our, our future. Do we have to work to overcome the general tie? Or are we fine? Are we fine? Is, is our, our membership... membership here, here's one. You would think every club would know this. I'm astounded by how many organizations I go into. And one of the first things that I ask them is, well, what's your census look like? Is your member, you know, how many members you got? Most clubs can tell you that. I've, I've literally encountered someone who said, well, I don't know, we got to call Francis, and Francis has been, you know, the bookkeeper for 40 years, and Francis says, oh yeah, you know, we have 300 members. That should be a known fact. Uh, is our membership growing? Is it shrinking? Is it flat? Are we successfully attracting the members we want? Does it feel vital? Does it feel like we're going to have a future? Or is the membership just kind of dead and dying? So is there vitality in the membership? Do we understand why? This is where most of this stuff gets really interesting. So you get to the point where you have facts, you know that if it's community sailing, we have so many visitors, we have whatever. Do we know why? Do we know why people come? Do we know why they come back or not? Any of you skiers? Any of you ski? I'm going to date myself. 30 years ago, maybe you ski 30 years ago. Um, when I used to do this for a living, we did work with U.S. skiing, which was akin to U.S. sailing, by the way. The favorite pastime of most skiers was to beat up U.S. skiing. 
It was a self-destructive activity. You know, the, the most fun thing in skiing was to bitch about the sport. And to poke U.S. skiing, there's a skiing anarchy and all that stuff, right? It was fun to just shoot everybody. And the free skiers came along, and the snowboarders came along, and U.S. skiing was the, you know, the stiff, the six guys at the bar. And skiing was dying. So we then got retained by the skiing industry. And you know what we discovered? You know why skiing wasn't growing? Because everybody skis once. And 30 years ago, people would ski once and they'd never come back. And the reason they never came back is because the industry had done everything possible to make the newbie totally humiliated. You know, you'd be on the bunny trail. <laughs> You're in the newbie group. You have a giant green sticker on your jacket. And there's some calendar eye candy male Austrian guy in tights. You know, in your face, making you feel completely inept while he flirts with your girlfriend. You know, it, I, I'm not making this up. You remember skiing 30 years ago? It was insider and everybody else. And the statistics on how many people tried it once and said, never again. It made me feel small. It made me feel uneducated. It made me feel unathletic. The hassle factor. You know, there was none of this stuff they have now, like little ski valets and good food and all that. You had to be out of your mind. You know, I got lucky, because that was the only other thing my parents did. They got us into skiing. So we skied and we sailed. Have any of you been skiing in the last five years? Can you believe the change? It's, it's almost like they want you to do it. <laughs> right? What a novel idea. It's almost welcoming. We want you to come back. We want your kids to come back. We want you to grow up in the sport. What a novel idea. So ask yourself the question, do you know why your members are voting with their feet? Do you know why? That's a really important question. In my planning experience, the greatest self-delusion lies around the why debate. The reason nobody comes back is X. The answer to that question really, or, or conversely, the reason people are lined up at the door trying to get into Ida Lewis is, it's really important to know that. Because that's what you have to protect. And if it's broken, that's what you have to fix. Do we understand the link between the size and growth of our membership and the health of our club? Does size, you know the pun, size matters? Not in everything. There's a lot of tension in a lot of clubs around, are we thriving or are we exclusive? Those are loaded or exclusive and how to get that right. That's, that's at the heart of a lot of debates. Are our membership standards understood and supported? Uh, I've, I've been privileged to do some of this kind of work with the New York Hat Club. And one of the things we discovered, this was kind of shocking, one of the biggest inhibitors to the growth of the membership in the New York Hat Club was a complete misunderstanding of what it took to be a member and how the process really worked. And it was perceived as so daunting as to be intimidating. So even long-standing members would hesitate to bring forward a terrific prospective member. And, and it was fear. It was fear of the process. The process was kind of, you know, it was the old men in blue blazers and straw hats and all that baloney that kind of, you know. It's actually a very welcoming place. Shocking. And, and I say that as a member who came from out of the blue. I was out of sailing for about 20 years while I was working for a living. And then I got back into it. And I remember when I was invited to join the New York Hat Club. I said, I'm, I'm not easily intimidated, but I got to admit, I was, I was excited, but I was intimidated. New York Hat Club. It's actually a very welcoming place. It was a self-limiting characteristic. Our own membership did not understand the membership process and perceived it as mysterious, daunting, you know, don't even know where to begin. 
And yet, I will tell you, lesson learned over the years, what's your single greatest source of future members? Your membership. Your membership. How do you make your members ambassadors for the future membership? Very important question. Does the nomination process work well? You know, that committee matters. I would argue that membership committee really matters. Make sure that process works well. Make sure it's healthy. Are good people involved in the life of the club? Is the leader, again, a uh, Gary story about those six angry guys at the bar. Is, are good people involved in the life of the club, or is the leadership group frozen, you know, kind of dead in its tracks, or is the leadership group renewing? A renewing, healthy, expandable leadership group. To, to me, the ideal club, every member feels like a leader. Every, every member feels like a leader, is, is for me the ideal. Let's talk about the second one, membership engagement. Uh, I have learned that active members drive the feel of the club, the perceptions of the club, and any of you treasurers or on the finance committee of the club, they drive the economics of the club. You know that secret if you've been involved in that. So active members drive the feel of the club, the perceptions of the club, and the economics of the club. So this gets really important. Ask yourself these questions. Are you happy, are we happy with the number of active members in our club? Do we have enough participation in important events? Do we understand how different groups of members wish to use the club? Please get facts here. Don't respond to emotional assertions. What you'll discover in the club is people, people have an axe to grind, or they have their pet. So you get these sweeping statements. No one wants to do that. Everyone wants a pool. Well, that can't possibly be true. When I understand, you know, everyone, as soon as you hear those words, you know, well, okay, you got a point of view, maybe you're right, maybe you're not right, but I guarantee you, everyone does not want a pool. Someone wants a pool. So let's, let's get some facts. Do we understand the wishes of the membership as opposed to, I got an extra grind, I don't like tennis courts. Are our members highly satisfied? And what drives member satisfaction? What are the two or three most important things for you to do in your club to influence member satisfaction? Very important question. Can we clearly articulate our most important activities? Gary, Gary called them signature events. Signature events. Most great clubs have a, hand, a handful of signature events. Go ahead. Are these going to be available at this time? I'll make sure they are. I'm pretty sure Jack has all this stuff. They're going to load this stuff, I think, in a website. But I'll, I'll, I'll make sure this is set. Because I, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, and this is like a 92-part checklist. And you'll go home, and it'll be like Christmas Eve, and the bike has no instructions. So I'll just have to make sure. Um, signature events really matter. What are those two or three things that are the can't, the can't miss events in the life of your club? Uh, those, those matter. Conversely, signature events are a huge tax on time and resources and money. Are there things we clearly won't support? Those are tough, tough. One of the hardest things to do in a club is to say no. It's hard. And, and deliberation about those things we're really going to commit to versus those things that you know, may be worthy, God bless them, but they're just not us. They, they, just, they just don't fit. Um, I, I think it's a really important conversation. It's a tough conversation. It's an important conversation. And, and again, this similar to the signature event thing. What are what are the activities, the events, the programs that really define the membership experience? What what is it? 
When, when someone sits down at the beginning of the year and has to write that check for that capital call or that annual event, whatever it is, you know, what, what, are the, what are the couple of things that will really be on that person's mind? The brief, the, uh, my own personal example, Royal Ocean Racing Club. Every year, I, I don't even, I hide the envelope when it comes, because the answer is, why on earth are we members of that thing? I think I've been to London, I've been in the clubhouse three times. It just means something to me, I love it. I got, I got invited to join, I don't know how many, you get invited to join if you win a big ocean race. And, and one of the, you know, I'm a kid from the Midwest, I got lucky, we won an ocean race. It's not a, it's not a lot of money, it's in pounds, so I don't even know what it costs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an active member. You know, I will have to die. Nancy will quit the club after I die. And so there's some, there's some connection with that. So, so what is it about your organization that forms that emotional bond with your target audience? Membership enrichment. This is the weird one. It's kind of the soft side. Um, and I just touched on it a moment ago with my Royal Ocean store. You know, at, at, at some level, there's this, why am I proud to be a member question. Why, why do I feel good about my affiliation with this organization? Even, even if it's tangential. Even if it's tangential. So New York, New York to me is an eye-opening. I think we have, uh, I should know this, I, I think we have 32. <laughs> I mean, poke fun at people who don't know how many members they have. I, I used to be more involved in New York. I think it's about 3,200 members. Is Steve 3,200? 3,000 of them never visit New York or Newport. And yet, and yet, it's a faithful membership. It's a faithful membership. Why? Why? Very interesting question. What does our club stand for? What is the distinctive appeal? And this is not one size fits all. I assure you, the 3,200 men and women who are members of New York are not members for one reason. They're members for a whole host of very personal reasons. And I think this is true of any yacht club. What does the club stand for? What is our distinctive appeal? Are we preserving, delivering, and reinforcing those sources of distinctive appeal? Or, or do we just sort of take our legacy for granted? You know, really, really tapping into the soft side of what is the nature of our appeal as an institution to our membership, and, and what do we do to cherish that, protect it, reinforce it, transmit it? Very important question. How do we communicate with our members? One of the things that excites me, I am not a tech guy, but I will tell you, the communication options that are cheap and effective are now limitless. Limitless. I think some of the cool, even in a place kind of as uh, structured as the New York Yacht Club, some of the coolest things going are just the fleet, you know, some of the fleet blogs and just, you know, the guerrilla warfare stuff that grows up around our sport. Some of it's sponsored by the club, some of it just spontaneous among sailors. The communication options are limitless. We are so far beyond just the old newsletter that we mimeograph and crank. Remember those days? They're, you know, it's, it's limitless. Now, therein lies some hazards, but I think it's more good than bad. Most clubs, I think, chronically under-communicate. And that's not necessarily a shot at the club. I think it's just life in the modern world. We're all distracted. We're all snow blind with information bombardment. Every time I've been formally involved with a club doing planning, though, one of the things we try to do is some survey work. We try to understand. The, the amount members know about their own club is shockingly little. Shockingly little. So there's a huge opportunity, huge opportunity, in my opinion, for communication enhancement, communication enrichment. Can we clearly articulate our most important activities, events, programs? Can we headline them? Uh, are we doing a good job on the awareness side of the equation? Uh, here's, here's one. How do members' emotive connections strengthen or weaken 
over time. And in particular, what I find in a lot of clubs is an age trough. It's really, really hard to bridge young members into older, active for life members. Now, part of that is just reality. You know, people get married, they get jobs, they have kids, conditions change, they move away, Lord knows what. But any club where I've ever actually done the analysis and looked at the evolution of the membership over time, it is not a straight line. It is not a straight line. I don't know, is, is Jory Hinman in the room? He's here at the, he's here at the program. Jory, Jory was founder of the New York Act Club back when the club was less dynamic. And I'd argue, having now seen the numbers, God bless Jory Hinman, the single most powerful thing New York did from a membership standpoint was Young Members, Young Members Program. And what it, what it's done, what it's done quantitatively for the club is provable. And I will tell you what it's done qualitatively in terms of energy, activity. You know, if you want to see the future of sailing, look at what the Young Members are doing. You know, they were the first to jump into team racing. They were the first to start promoting the, the, the rebirth of match racing. They're, I mean, they're just, you know, if you want to see the possibilities, get a young members program going, and then don't overregulate it and see what happens. And it, it's phenomenal. But what it's, Steve, what it's done for New York is unbelievable. And it happens fast. You, know, you don't have to work on this for 40 years. You know, it, it happens relatively fast. Uh, how can enrichment initiatives reinforce activity and connectivity? The reason I'm just juxtaposing those two words, uh, you have your active members. I think you'll discover no matter what kind of club it is, this is so obvious in hindsight, but even a global club like New York, activity is 100% driven by how far you live from the club. It is 100% driven. There are exceptions to be sure, but even in a global club like New York, house usage is something like, I don't know, it's 90% driven by people who live within 75 miles of Manhattan and Newport. That's kind of a dull finding. You know, people who live near the club, unless the club is dysfunctional, will be your heaviest users and your most active. But what about connectivity? What about that 75% or 50% or 90% of the membership who maybe physically visits the club a couple times a year. How do you connect with them? How, how do you deliver? See, again, this is where I think technology and things like that is, is fascinating. We're doing a lot of stuff uh, at New York with history and heritage and, and just kind of content. Content. This deliverable, you know, over the web, digital streaming, you know, you name it. Think, things that give a person an attachment to the club that's spiritual and emotional and intellectual, unconstrained by where do I live. I think there are great possibilities there uh, to do, do a lot more with your membership. Um, finally, let me, let me turn to this perpetuation question. I, I think this is it's about leadership, financial strength, and the caliber of the assets. Uh, leadership. Do our basic governance processes provide for strong leadership today and tomorrow? Do our processes deliver good people who will provide sound oversight into the life of the club and into the leadership of the club? Flag succession, very important. I can't tell you how many clubs I've seen paralyzed by debate over the bad Commodore. Right, the guy who's just done the work, is in the chain, when you hear things like, well, you know, Sam's inevitable. Inevitable is not a rousing word. Hey, follow me. My leadership is inevitable. <laughs> Couldn't find anyone better. Now, I, again, these issues are hard in a social order. We're not choosing a CEO here. But, but, you know, are we delivering good flags? Clubs deserve good people in leadership positions. Do our committees work well? 
Almost every club has some dead committees. Kill them. Do them a favor. They already died. Kill them. So it's, I think, renewing committees. Renewal, you know, I, I once worked with a CEO who I loved who reorganized his company every three years. They were in a perpetual state of kind of transition. And I asked him why. He said, anything that persists for three years gets stale. He said, as soon as the people in my company kind of learn all the moves and everything starts to be a repeat, I mess it up. I mess it up. Now, I thought that was a little too much perpetual imbalance. But how many of you feel like you're in clubs where it's like Groundhog Day? <laughs> you ever seen that movie? Tomorrow's exactly like today, and I'm consigned to a hell of ever reliving it. Right? That, that's not a fun place to go. Um, let's talk financial stuff. At the end of the day, you know, money matters. I mean, even in a club. Um, many clubs suffer from, you know, eyes bigger than stomach kind of syndrome. Are, are, we, are we practicing good hygiene with respect to budgets, financial stewardship? Uh, is there a match between what we want to do and what we can do? Um, and, and God bless people who are willing to do that work in a club. Uh, you know, I, I raised my hand like that. I said I will never be on a finance committee. I want to go to the yacht club and have fun. Um, but God bless the people who do it. I think some of your strongest uh, members from a technical standpoint, um, if you can get them to do it, should have a look at the books. I, I think the people minding the store on the financial stuff uh, really matter. Are we properly allocating scarce resources? You know, getting that balance right between the shore program and the water program. You know, is it tyranny of the House Committee or is it tyranny of the Sailing Committee? Uh, is the youth program, are the moms out of control? You know, you have, so how you, and I don't mean that the gender point there, by the way. The men are just inside control of the moms. They just have different, you know, pet, pet projects. How do you iron all that out? It's tricky. It's tricky. You can't spend over the moon on everything. So how do you iron that out? Facilities. Facilities really matter. Um, in many clubs, the facility is the house. Uh, in many clubs, some of the toughest choices are around land, waterfront. Uh, I, I tend to share, uh, despite my point about financial responsibility, I tend to share a little bit of what Gary and Kenny said this morning. If great land becomes available, buy it. Buy it. Figure out how to do it. Figure out how to do it. If it's out of reach, it's out of reach. But most, most clubs, you yeah. know, you either pass the hat among the deeper members or however you, you finance it, however you do it. But, but land really matters. A lot of clubs become landlocked. And it really starts to kind of put some limits on the program. So I think the, just the physical plant strategy of the club is a big variable to get right. Okay, we're getting near the end of this thing. I want to close with maybe my favorite page. This, this is the part of this. I leave you with one idea. The word planning usually makes me run the other way if I'm not working. Planning essentially is just talking about voting. Planning in Yacht Club, sitting around, shooting the breeze about sailing. I want to start with the center of this diagram. My assistant did this for me, and she has never, ever, ever set foot on a boat. I wanted this to look like you know the bottom of a mooring. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't really. It's supposed to be the bottom of a mooring, a mooring anchor. The, the mooring anchor, to me, is the forces of stability. It's the six guys at the bar. It's all the reasons why we shouldn't change anything. And those forces of stability in a club are everything from safety, well, we can't possibly do that, it's unsafe, <coughs> rules and regimentation, any sport, must have consistent standards. I actually don't make light of that. I think a big part of U.S. sailing is rulemaking, equity and ratings. You know, you gotta, you gotta have standards. Governing body, internal experts, affordability. Almost any club is chained to a tyranny of what we've been doing. 
And it's usually some combination of all those considerations. And, and the upshot of it all is usually we've had a great debate. We're going to stick with what we know. Had a great debate, appreciate your input, sort of. We stick with what we know. Look at all the things that we could be doing. Look at all the things that we could be doing. And this is this is a very impartial list. How how many people in this room have ever tried team racing? Have you ever tried team racing? Embrace team racing. It's a sailor's fit. You can go hunt people. <laughs> What's every sailor's fantasy? I can go hunt that guy. Every boat matters. Boat six matters as much as boat one. How, how many times do you go sailing and it's, it's over before it's over? And the top third of the fleet's racing and everyone else is, you know, twirling and just want it to end. <laughs> Team racing. Boat six is equal to boat one. Right? It's, it's every sailor's dream. It's like lacrosse and hockey. You can go check people. You can block. You can trap. You know, let's, let's get hopped up. This is aggressive. Plus, you got to be thinking. That's maybe the negative. You got to be thinking. It's like playing three-dimensional chess. It is cool. And I'm not Dave Perry. I'm an amateur, 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 you know, sea flight team sailor. Most fun I've ever had. Absolute class. How many of you, I, I felt like, again, my assistant thought it was matching racing. I meant it to be match racing. How many of you have done match racing at any level? At any level? How many of you are in clubs with active, been active, not two weirdos out there, active match racing? Why aren't we doing, here's my fantasy, by the way. We're going to try to get this going. Have any of you ever been like in a tennis club or a squash club where they have a member or ladder and they constantly rank? All the players, one through, you can challenge anybody. My dream is to walk in the bar and have a match racing leaderboard <coughs> with an A flight and a B flight. And I can walk up to Kenny Reed in the bar and say, hey, dude, Sunday, you and me. You and me. And Kenny will laugh, but if Nancy's in it, we'll go do it. Kenny and Nancy grew up together. We'll go out and screw around. How much fun would that be? And I'm not trying to humiliate. You can hop out. It's not for everybody. But I would love it. If we had a match racing league table, you could have a pro flight, an amateur flight, let people call each other out. Let's go do it. Boom, right now. Let's go match racing. You know, 20 bucks and some free drinks. Uh, not 20 bucks, that's illegal. <laughs> Pass legal, but you know, I'm going to use not. <laughs> so it's still going to go match racing, but good. I didn't mean that. Here's one of my favorites. How many of you have ever done a pursuit race? Pursuit race. Any yacht club, almost any yacht club, is in an interesting enough body of water that you can go pursuit racing. And if, 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 if there's ever a great way to involve kind of a, the marginal cruising, perf, want to go racing, it's a pursuit race. It's a ball. It's a ball. It's an absolute ball. And it's fresh. Couldn't agree more with the point made this morning about the tyranny of windward lures. And I had a boat that only did windward lures. I, even I got to hate windward lures. Pursuit race. I had so much fun at the Fregali race in a, in a fit of emotion. I got married on the back of my boat at the end of the Fregali race. I woke up the next morning. I, was, I said, we got married. Still happily married. This is the answer. Pursuit racing got me my wife. <laughs> If ever there was a commercial for pursuit racing. There's so much we can do. The high performance rule. You know, the stuff, the stuff, you know, we, we, we lost the ratings war to Europe, the IRC. Um, the HPR rule is fascinating. Have any of you gone, you know, these 40 to 50 foot reaching freaks? Any, any of you been planning in these new? Yeah, Ben, there you go. Speaking of HPR, shout out for HPR. It, it is way beyond my skill level, but I'll tell you, you hit your ride on one of those boats, it, it, it is just hair on fire. Absolutely hair on fire. multi hulls spoiling. One of, one of the coolest things going on in Newport is these, these young stuffs with moss. You see these 
these moths flying around. So I guess my view, whether it's kiteboarding, kayaking, stand-up paddle, you know, if it floats, consider it. Consider it. I had a long talk with Gary, you know, with Jack Gerhardt about U.S. sailing. And I said, you know, um, our sport attracts libertines, creative people who want to pursue self-expression on the water. And I think, unfortunately, U.S. sailing sometimes gets painted into the establishment corner. I think it's unfair. They get painted. And to me, again, it's very analogous to U.S. skiing in the early days of snowboarding, freestyle, you know, if you could strap it on your feet and buy a GoPro, you have sport. You have sport. We should, we should promote that. We should promote that. <coughs> Not fight it. Let's not get painted into the anti-progress, anti-diversity, anti-tribe stuff, especially given what Kenny's talking about right now, right next door, which is the technology enablement of our sport, the technology enablement of doing funky stuff on the water has never been greater. It's never been greater. It blows my mind what's happened. And I'm not a scientist, but it's, it's material. You know, sailing still equals, right? Sail area and resistance. The physics of it are pretty basic. And, you know, it's, it's kind of sail area displacement. What, what materials are enabling in terms of, like, crazy, funky, unheard of relationships between apparent wind and resistance is unbelievable. And we should, we should embrace that. You know, this furor about kiteboarding. What's the furor? I think it's a cool, I will never kiteboard. Look at me. I will never kiteboard. I love watching it. I love watching it. So, so this page to me is just a plea to try new things. At the heart of your club should be excitement, should be groups of people who are really animated, you know, 3,200 members in New York, Steve, how many are going to be HBR people? A fraud, you know. Maybe, maybe 10 or more now. Yeah, so, so 10. But the excitement being created by that little nerve center around these freaky high-performance folks, you know, God, God, God bless them. So my view is Big Ten. Big Ten. Uh, in closing, I, I just wanted to maybe, maybe end with some happy thoughts. Um, Please, 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 never forget why we do this. There's too much pucker factor in our sport. Clubs should be fun. Planning in a club should be fun. Working on the life of a club should be fun. So, you know, we do this for our kids. We do this for our boats. The guy that owns that red boat thinks it's the most beautiful boat in the world. We do it for history. This is Weatherly. I love Weatherly. I keep coming back to Weatherly. We do it to go beautiful places. We do it for friends. These are four of my best friends on earth. Well, actually, the five, four of them are my best friends on earth. <laughs> we do it. I'm, I'm the overweight guy in the shirt driving the boat. Where, where else can a guy like me compete? Compete. I'm 58 years old. I'm, I'm not going to play in the Super Bowl. The beauty of our sport, 58 years old, if I want to, I can go mess with a bunch of highly paid pros, never pay the guy on my boat. And yet, we, we go mix them up, and, it, and it's fun. Where, where else can you go? What other sport can a guy my age still have the thrill of competition against, against worthy opponents? And we do it for beautiful sunset after beautiful sunset after beautiful sunset. So thank you very much. God bless your efforts to keep our sport going. Make your clubs better. Embrace diversity. Try stuff. Try stuff, try stuff, try stuff. Thank you.